Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, make us worthy to celebrate the feast of your transfiguration on the mountain, with purity and with holiness, with divine praises and with hymns of the Holy Spirit. May we be filled with spiritual joy and gladness and raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the Church and her children. Billy, you can, you can serve. So, Billy, you can serve. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to Jesus Christ, the radiant light beyond description, who shines forth from the eternal Father. He revealed the mystery of the most exalted Trinity to us on the day when he was transfigured on the sacred mountain. And he revealed the mystery of his divinity to his holy disciples and confirmed them in the true faith when they saw his glory. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. <clears throat> o Christ, our God, you showed yourself to Moses in the burning bush that was not consumed. In ancient times you appeared to your people in a pillar of fire, in a cloud, in lightning, in a clap of thunder and in the sound of a trumpet. Likewise, on this day you chose to fulfill your plan of salvation for us. You went up to the top of the mountain with your disciples, Peter, James, and John, and you were transfigured before them with the light of your divine glory, as your clothing became dazzling white. They saw Moses and Eliyah, and they heard them speaking with you. Then Peter said, O Lord, it is good for us to be here. Allow us to make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Eliam. Then they heard the voice of your Father from heaven saying to them, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. They fell to the ground and were overcome by fear but you raised them up by your great power and enlightened them, ordering them to reveal this great mystery until your passion and resurrection in Jerusalem. Now, Christ, our God, we implore you with the fragrance of this incense to fill your church with the light of your transfiguration. Confirm us in the true faith of your apostles, and in your compassion forgive all our sins, and in your mercy remember our departed. And we raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Spirit of holiness now and forever.
We adore you, O Christ, our Lord. When you were transfigured on the mountain, you called Moses and Elijah to witness to you. And you confirm the faith of your disciples. Receive our prayers and the fragrance of our incense. Grant us joy and happiness with you in the light of your eternal kingdom, where we shall continuously praise and glorify you, your Father and your Spirit of holiness, forever. Kadi shantaloho kadi shant hariyatoho kadi With joy from the mountains, Jesus showed himself as Lord. Offer praise to the Lord God, his face brightens all the world. reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and the children forever. Brothers and sisters, now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone was so glorious, that the Israelites could not look intently at the face of Moses because of its glory that was going to fade, how much more will the ministry of the Spirit be glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation was glorious, the ministry of righteousness will abound much more in glory. Indeed, what was endowed with glory has come to have no glory in this respect because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was going to fade was glorious, how much more will what endures be glorious? Therefore, since we have such hope, we act very boldly and not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so the Israelites could not look intently at the cessation of what was fading. Rather, their thoughts were rendered dull, for to this present day the same veil remains unlifted when they read the Old Covenant, because through Christ it is taken away. To this day, in fact, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts, but whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, 
And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Praise be to God always. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Saint Mark, who proclaimed life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The Lord Jesus says, Amen, I say to you, there are some who stand here who shall not taste death until they see the kingdom of God established in power. And after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and he led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothing became dazzling white, such as no fuller on earth could bleach them. Then Elijah appeared to them, along with Moses, and they were speaking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Eliyah. He hardly knew what he was saying, as they were so afraid. And then a cloud came upon them, casting a shadow over them, and from the cloud came a voice, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. This is the truth. Peace be with you. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. So on this glorious feast day of the Transfiguration, we come to something which is very central to the Eastern churches. It's celebrated, of course, both East and West, but in the East, it is something central as being our spiritual life, very much the reality. It's not just about Jesus. In fact, it's more about us and what we receive. If you remember, if you noticed in the Masmuro, 
that we sang before the reading, the three verse hymn. It talks about the face of our Lord being across the face of the earth, the face of our Lord that is really our faith, the foundation and the reality and the passing of redemption. Which is why what takes place in the Transfiguration, and as you come up today, you'll notice on the icon, with Moses and Eliyah on each side of him, our Lord's, the pinnacle that our Lord is standing on, the rock as the artist has placed it, is a lighter stone. And the, darker, and the stone that Moses and Elijah are standing on are darker stones. And they're darker stones because it's representing the old covenant in contrast to the new covenant. When our Lord says, this is my beloved son, you have to remember he's being framed by Moses and Elias. Moses is the law, the Torah. And Elijah is the prophets. He represents all the prophets of the old law. Moses, we celebrate his memorial on the 5th of August, so yesterday. Elijah, we have a memorial on July 20th, but remember he was elevated and raised in the chariot of fire. He's not considered to be dead. And he is actually by the fathers considered to be one of the two witnesses that will return at the time of the Antichrist, as St. John speaks of it in the book of Revelation. So it's a very mysterious thing that takes place here. But what is showing between these two is that Elias and Moses are speaking with our Lord. In the Gospel of St. Luke, we're told they're speaking about our Lord's excess that he's going to accomplish in Jerusalem. The extreme ridiculousness of God being betrayed, spit upon and put to death, the excess. And so in the midst of this glory, that's the meaning when it says, this is my beloved son. This is the Christ. This is the Messiah. This is the fulfillment of all the law and of the prophets. So hear him, listen to him. This is the very ground of everything. And so, of course, the light that radiates in our Lord is a manifestation of his glory, but it's not his divinity. You cannot see divinity. It's not visible. You can't see it with eyes. What happens on this day on Mount Tabor is seen by the three apostles, Peter, James, and John. These are the same men who will be invited by our Lord to come with him into the Garden of Gethsemane in about a year's time. This vision of faith, if you want, of the manifestation of the face of God is meant to strengthen them so that when they see our Lord devastated and sweating blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, they will remember what had come before. And of course, we know the story, do we not? Uh, they don't remember. And so this contrast has many lessons in it. And of course, it's not all the apostles that are present. You know, we live in an age in which Christianity is portrayed as kind of a saccharine fountain of emotion at best. You do it if it feels good. If it doesn't feel good, you just stop going. Whatever you get out of it, that's what matters. You know, because you hear it from people. And if someone wants to be a little more upbeat, then it's really about, well, Jesus just loves everyone. And it's like, well, that's true. Otherwise, you wouldn't exist. The very foundational act of creation is an act of love. So the mosquitoes that sting you at camp are also loved by God. Now, we're all loved to varying degrees, and you see it manifested in this way by the fact that the Gospels very clearly tell us that there are certain people that are much closer to our Lord than others. Now, that's just blasphemy to that kind of saccharine version of Christianity. Though there is a fundamental love of all, there are some who are loved more than others, namely the saints. And because God loves them more, they become more holy. It's a mystery for a whole other sermon. But we see very clearly that out of the disciples, we see Bethany. We're told very clearly that Lazarus and Mary and Martha are very intimate friends with our Lord. It doesn't mean it's not an either or. It doesn't mean he doesn't love other people, but he really loves these people. And he finds a place of security because they respond to that love. And he chooses the 12 out of all the disciples. It doesn't mean he doesn't love the disciples, but he really loves these 12 men. And so when our Lord calls out Peter, James, and John out of the 12, he's showing something very specific that he wants them to be doing. 
And Peter, of course, will hold that specific office of confirming the brethren. James will be the first apostle to be martyred, and John will be the apostle who will be asked to live for almost, well, live a century. He lives to the end of the century as the last of the apostles to die. So they hold a very special place. And yet you see, even in that love, they don't understand what they're watching. They see this majesty that takes place, they hear the voice, but in between that you have St. Peter, who's so overwhelmed by all of this, he's actually mouthing and echoing what modern saccharinity actually wants. It's good for us to be here. We like this. This is, this is awesome. This is beautiful. That's why he says, let's make three tents. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. That way we can keep it here and retain it. It's beautiful. It's that moment of grace when you're on retreat or a day of recollection and everything's quiet and you're praying and it just feels wonderful. And the feeling is there to meant to support us to pursue goodness and virtue. It's there for a purpose, it's not useless. But feeling in itself is just feeling. And as we know in our lives, we can't make ourselves feel happy and we can't make ourselves feel sad. We can't do these things, but we can express, we can, we can control the expression of those emotions. So what Peter is overwhelmed by is, this really feels great. This is beautiful. He's not really discerning what's taking place here. So when he says this, we're told by St. Mark, and remember St. Mark is the evangelist, the gospel, when you read the gospel of St. Mark, this is the teaching of Peter. And this teaching then, he's telling you, this is what I did. And so St. Mark adds that conclude, adds the remark of saying, Peter doesn't even know what he's saying because they're so terrified of what's going on. They're overwhelmed by this vision. And because in the long term and in the vision from the vision of God and in wisdom, what Peter is saying doesn't make any sense really because he's trying to keep something for himself in feeling, our Lord doesn't even answer him. You know, there's no response from our Lord to this exuberant, I just love, you know, whatever, you know, the feeling of this revival. This is magnificent. Our Lord doesn't even react to that because it's just feeling. You actually have to listen to him, follow him as this face, this illuminated face. And that's why in the Husoyu, if you would be marked, you notice that what the prayers of the church say is that our Lord lifted them up in his power. This is a conversion experience, actually, that we are meant to model our lives on. That's why the contemplation of the, of the icon of the transfiguration is central to our Catholic faith. It's not just something that we do on August 6th, but it's something to actually consider what is actually being asked of us. Because when you look at the whole picture, and I encourage all of you to read both chapter 8 and chapter 9 of St. Mark at some point today or during these week, days to come during this week. Because this transfiguration is actually framed between two events. One is a case of possession, and one is the profession of faith of Peter. You know, the famous one. If Catholics know any scripture, they know St. Matthew 16, they know the chapter of You Are Christ, you are, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Catholics will know that one. That is the episode in chapter 8 of St. Mark. It doesn't have the aspect of Peter trying to dissuade our Lord and then being called Satan by our Lord. Mark doesn't record that. doesn't mean St. Peter didn't teach that part, but it's not recorded by St. Mark. But the profession of faith in Caesarea Philippi is, you are, what, who do men say that I am? What's the opinion of people? Right? Everyone has an opinion about Christianity. And so he says, what do they think I am? And the whole listing of different prophets and all that, they think you're prophets who have come back from the dead. And of course, the famous answer of St. Peter, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. You are the Messiah. But you'll notice that in that profession of faith, and then there's teachings in the rest of chapter eight, and then we have, after six days, the transfiguration. The after six days in the gospel that you have in the bulletin today, that we read today, 
is six days after the profession of the faith of St. Peter. So you have the profession of St. Peter in Caesarea Philippi, and over the six days and the teachings that are recorded by St. Mark, they come to Mount Tabor. So that it means that the transfiguration is taking place on the seventh day. The seventh day in Genesis is the day of rest of the first creation, the first creation of nature and of the first covenant with man and woman. So the seventh day is now being fulfilled by the eighth day that is being manifested by the light of our Lord's face in this transfiguration and of the voice of the Father from the luminous cloud that says, this is my beloved son. This is the one you are to listen to. This is the new covenant. This is the new creation. And then as they come out of this, we're told, and we didn't have it read in the gospel, but the immediate line after is after the, the, when the apostles raise their faces, they see only our Lord again by himself. And as they start walking down the mountain, our Lord says, you're not to tell anyone about this vision until the Son of Man rises from the dead in Jerusalem. And we're told by St. Mark that they're, they're discussing, what does this mean, rising from the dead? And then as they come to the bottom of the mountain, all these people are still waiting for them. And amongst them, the other nine apostles. And there's a father who's there with his son. So if you, if you Google or look up, if you have art books in your house, which books seem to be disappearing in this day and age, and find the, build, the painting by Raphael, the famous painting of Raphael. He's recording this episode of the Transfiguration and the episode that follows in chapter nine. Because you have our Lord levitating above and you have Moses and Elijah on each side that only in the style that can only be Raphael. But at the bottom, you have this boy with his eyes rolled up in the sockets falling back because this is the possessed humanity that is found after they come down the mountain. So there are many, many things in this chapter eight and chapter nine which are important to understand this isn't just here because it's pretty. Pretty is nice, but the face of Christ manifesting in our lives isn't always pretty. Remember a year from now, our Lord will sweat his precious blood in the garden of Gethsemane. Still the will of God, still the face of Christ, no nice feelings there, no warm interior tinglings going on in that point, but it's still the manifestation of God's glory. In fact, we could say in many ways, it's a greater manifestation of God's glory in the passion of our Lord because he truly shows the face of love, because he embraces death freely for us. And that's why this modern saccharine version of Christianity borders on blasphemy, let alone the question of being heretical, because it mutilates the image of what the gospel truly is. So the transfiguration is really about our conversion. And this is a lifelong thing. Between our profession that Peter says, and we know from the gospel of St. Matthew, Peter says you're the Christ. He believes it. He truly has the faith but he doesn't understand what that faith is actually meaning to him, which is why you have the famous episode immediately after of Peter trying to dissuade our Lord and saying, no, you're not going to go to Jerusalem and no, you're not gonna suffer. That's just not right. You're the Christ, come on, it's not gonna happen. And our Lord turns on him and just calls him Satan. You're Satan, you're an adversary. You're trying to dissuade me from my mission as being Messiah. And then he tells him very clearly why he's satanic. Because your thoughts are the thoughts of men and not of God. The transfiguration is all about elevating us from the profession of a faith which we do by grace, of course. But for many of us, it's fairly cerebral. We know there are seven sacraments. We can name them. We know there's seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. We may or may not be able to name those. We can name some of the spiritual works of mercy and some of the corporal works. Of, so we know this cerebral thing that was taught to us. But you'll notice between the, the possessed boy and, the, and the, the very distraught father that follows and that profession of faith, which still needs to be anchored and rooted within the life of Peter, you have the transfiguration. You should all have an icon of the transfiguration in your homes. Because in the moments when things are dark, look at the transfiguration and realize 
what our lives are meant to be. And in the moments when we're all bouncy and kind of warm, tingly, sentimental feelings, look at the, at the transfiguration and remember that Moses and Elijah are talking about our Lord's death with him in Jerusalem. It reminds us of both the light and the darkness because it reminds us fundamentally of the will of God. It is a blessed and beautiful thing. So on this day, we may ask that the face of Christ truly shine within us, truly shine through us and into all the world because it is the ground and the foundation of all the church. It is a beautiful thing on this day. May God richly bless you with the riches and the fullness of the abundance and of his holy face on this Feast of the Transfiguration. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial in the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men, for our salvation, he made our own heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and he came to For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and he rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory as the judge of the king of the dead, and see him on the of glory. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in the Father and the Son is the glory and the Lord of God, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and they look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Itteruot madem heim dalo ho, haluot alo ho dam pade tayo. Oenem sevo tayo ta keu lal vain toch vesku de paye plo, hod ho da shofa. Almighty 
thee to Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now receive these offerings that your children have brought to you, out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, <clears throat> we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude. Be mindful, O God, of the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Be mindful also of all those who share with us today in this offering. But remember, you're supposed to move and get the incense and all that in the second prayer, because you don't have to make everybody wait for you to. Do this in memory of me. Each time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember my death until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your can comprehend that you willingly emptied yourself of your divine glory, who can explain your miraculous birth from a virgin, who can repay you for your saving passion which you freely endured, who can praise your plan of salvation for us. We can only ask of you, O lover of all people, that the sacrifice which we have offered be accepted on your altar in heaven, the dwelling place of your hidden divinity, in the company of all the angels and saints. Through this sacrifice, may we be worthy of the forgiveness of our sins. When you come to judge the living and the dead, 
do not pass judgment upon us, nor deny us, saying, I do not know you. On that glorious and fearful day, do not separate us from you, nor cast us out of your paradise to a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Rather, because of your holy name by which we have been called, look with mercy upon us. In your compassion you have made us worthy of the gift of your forgiving body and blood. So make us worthy to be one with you in holiness, as you are one with your Father. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you, implores your Father, saying, O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you. To sanctify the power, to the Holy Spirit, to sanctify the salt, to sanctify the salt, and to rest upon this bread and wine, that they may become the one body and blood of your only Son. Manin Murio, Manin Murio, Manin Murio, Nite Moro, Hohayo, Kodisho, Wanda Fen, the line of Alukodabono, oh no. This bread and the body of Christ our God be for us a pledge of the life to come, a body that grants us the everlasting joys of heaven, a body that renews our souls and bodies, a body that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. And that the mixture in this chalice, the blood of Christ our God, be a blood that gives new life to those who receive it, a blood that guides us to the safe harbors and the dwellings of light, a blood that renews our souls and bodies, a blood that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. O Lord, in your great mercy, when this body and blood is mingled with our bodies and souls, Grant that it may be for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and for the everlasting joy and eternal life with all your saints. Amen. We offer you, Lord God, this pure and holy offering for your holy, Catholic, and apostolic Church, which you have redeemed. Gather her children into unity, love, and faith, and guide them in peace and security. We offer it for the pure bishops of the true faith, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Shara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, the Venerable Priests, the Chaste Deacons, the Pure Subdeacons, and all the Orders of the Church. Teach them the word of truth so that they may spread it faithfully with justice and holiness May they care for the flock that you have entrusted to them. Give them the proper means to accomplish your will and grant them a long life. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and dejected, for orphans and widows, for the sick and distressed, for those tempted by evil spirits, be the guardian and refuge of their lives. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Remember the holy fathers, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, and confessors, especially the holy, glorious, and blessed ever Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Saint John the Baptist, <laughs> the messenger and forerunner who witnessed the betrothal of your holy church to your son, glorious Saint Stephen, the archdeacon and first martyr, and all who pleased you and professed your name, 
we pray to you, O Lord. For all the faithful departed who have gone to you from this altar and from every place throughout the world, grant them rest in your heavenly dwellings with all your saints, and in your mercy forgive our sins and theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed with or without full knowledge. O Lord, do not deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray, so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do your will. Forgive us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions, hidden and seen, committed with or without full knowledge. Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you, and join us to your righteous ones, and to those who have done your will, that in us and in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. O Lord, you are the pleasing oblation who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest who offered yourself as the Lamb. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you be glory forever. O Lord, our Lord, you sent us your only Son, who is the radiance of your eternity. And he accomplished his plan of salvation for us, that we may come to you. May we call upon you with the prayer that he taught his holy disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of thy now and forever. Yes, O merciful Lord, we ask for your compassion. By your grace, make us worthy that your glorious name may be made holy in us, that your kingdom come to assist us in our weakness, and that your will dwell within us. Deliver us from all difficult temptations, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, with your only Son and with your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo Elokolifunna. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord God, you are good and the lover of all people. Look upon those who bow their heads before your majesty and bless them with every spiritual blessing. Do not turn us away when we approach your divine and holy gifts. And let us not be guilty of unworthily receiving the body and blood of your only Son. Rather, make us worthy, 
who share in your holy and life-giving mysteries with purity, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your good and holy spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the most holy trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask you for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord, our God, to you be glory forever. <laughs> Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, O compassion and merciful one. O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
Ron. Lord Jesus, you have made us worthy to share in your holy body and in the cup of salvation. How can we repay you for these, your gifts and graces, and for your goodness? As you have called us to approach this life-giving banquet, make us worthy, so that your body may be mingled with our bodies and your blood with our souls for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and for eternal life. You are blessed and your kingdom is holy, and we raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo el O God the Father, we bow before you, and we entrust ourselves to your care. We ask you, imploring your mercy to rest your right hand full of blessings upon us. Assist us, protect us, bless us, and sanctify us by the living cross of your only Son. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.